We are living on a planet facing almost insurmountable challenges. Challenges we have to face sooner rather than later. The world needs our energy. She needs our ideas, our passion. It's up to us to change things, make a positive change to the planet, to feed the world, to protect the future, to live well, to be the generation that will make a change. Join us. Kia koto katoa. Thank you, Travis. Thank you all for coming. Before I start, I just want to acknowledge that what I'm going to talk about tonight is not just my work, but the work of a whole bunch of people, many collaborators, and particularly collaborators over at Landcare Research and, and within the Bioprotection Center and elsewhere in the world. What I'm going to talk to you about tonight are invasive trees, their interaction with invasive fungi. I'll spend a little bit of time talking about the role of invasive mammals in dispersing these fungi. But I really want to focus in on the effects of these invasions below ground, how they're modifying ecosystems, and then bring that back around to showing how understanding that helps us understand and manage plant invasions. But before I do that, I just want to start by saying the obvious, which is we live in an amazing country. New Zealand is truly unique. And part of that are the species that are found here. Not just the obvious things like Hector's dolphins and the world's only alpine parrot, but also the less obvious things, insects, fungi, plants that we may not think of often, but are part of our ecosystems. And that's not just an environmental issue, but it's also an economic one. Tourism is one of the largest components of our ecosystem, or sorry, of our economy, bringing in $18.5 billion a year and providing 7% of employment. In terms of numbers, though, we really don't have that many species. There are about 2,200 native plants in New Zealand, only two native terrestrial mammals, both bats. We have no idea how many fungi. We've named over 8,000, probably 41,000 in total. But although the numbers aren't high, there's a very high level of endemism. 81% of our plants are only found in New Zealand. That's the highest level of endemism anywhere in the world. At the same time, we have an economy that relies on bringing plants to New Zealand, exotic plants that we've brought for farming, plants and animals, or just because we like the way that they look, like this rose, or by accident, like the blowfly. Nobody wanted it here, but it came along anyway. And our economy is really also based on these introduced species, which is good, except that sometimes they jump to areas we don't want them, and then they become a weed. In terms of numbers, we've worked very hard at introducing species. We have 25,000 introduced plants in New Zealand, more than 10 times the number of natives. And of those, 2,500 have become invasive. So we have more invasive plants in New Zealand than we have natives. 32 invasive mammals and around 2,000 invasive fungi that we know of. Now, when we think about plants, it's important to understand that plants don't occur in a vacuum. They don't occur just as themselves, but they actually occur in a complex set of interactions. And that's nowhere more true than when you look at the soil, where the interesting parts of plants are, the roots. They have to obtain nutrients from complex sources, ranging from nitrate to organic sources, phosphorus, carbon. They interact with bacteria and fungi that are making those nutrients available, but also sometimes attacking the plant. And they interact with a whole host of animals in the soil, particularly mites and nematodes. When you take a plant and you introduce it to a new area and take it out of its native range, you actually can leave behind a lot of its enemies. So things like uh, pathogens can be reduced, and we call that enemy release. And it's very important in why a plant can become invasive. At the same time, plants rely on mutualists endophytes, nitrogen-fixing bacteria, mycorrhizae, and those can also be left behind, which is much less well understood, but can lead to mutualist limitation. There is perhaps no better example of that than in the case of pines. Pine trees have been introduced around the world, South Africa, South America, Australia, New Zealand, and they worked very hard to get them established. In fact, the early attempts to plant pines largely failed. They were very patchy, it was difficult to grow, and that's how foresters first realized that pines rely on interactions with fungi, with a diverse group of fungi. Those fungi form associations with the root, actually enveloping the root in fungal hyphae, and then those hyphae explore out into the soil, gathering nutrients, bringing it back to the plant. And there's a huge diversity of fungi involved here. 
and they range from in form, color, shape. In this case, I've sort of put them from smooth types on the left to more um, extensive types on the right, and those also vary in their ability to acquire different nutrients, with the smooth types mostly taking up mineral nutrients and the more ex exploratory types taking up organic nutrients. So once we realized that plants rely on these fungi, we were able to introduce them. That was found out very early. So from 1930, you could see papers saying it's now being realized that we need to introduce mycorrhizal fungi in order to get trees to grow. That was true in this case in the UK, but it was also true in New Zealand. Here's an example as late as the 1980s saying poor establishment of tree seedlings, this is Pinus contorta, at high elevations is due to a lack of mycorrhizal fungi. Let's inoculate the seed with mycorrhizae. And that's what they did. They very deliberately spread fungi into tree nurseries and into these environments and went from this situation to a situation where now you can grow pines easily in almost any country of the world by adding inoculum. And that's been a very good thing as it underpins our forestry industry. But unfortunately, it's also led to trees becoming invasive. To give you an idea of the scale, this is the amount of New Zealand that's currently influenced by wild and conifers. Up to the year 2000, people started realizing there's a problem. They started spending, we think, around $4.5 million a year on controlling wild and conifers. Up to 2007, where they realized they needed to spend more, started spending $11 million a year. And you would hope that that curve would now start going down. There's what it actually did. So 6.5% of the country is considered affected by wild and conifers. And you may have noticed in the budget this year, $16 million more being invested into conifers. To give an idea of the, uh, more of a visual picture of that, this is Mount Barker up near Lake Coolidge. There's a farm down there. They had a little hedgerow of Pinus nigra. It spread up the mountain. Everything dark green in that is a pine tree. Once it hit the top of the mountain, it took off in the wind and spread extensively. So the question is, how did we go from a situation where pines were difficult to grow to one where they've become such a bad invasive? Well, when we started thinking about this a couple years ago, we realized that our native forest is also ectomycorrhizal and has a diverse community of fungi. So one possibility is that those native fungi are going from our native beach and crossing over and starting to form associations with the pine, which we would call a novel association. Of course, the other possibility is that we've got non-native fungi coming in with the pine, so we've got co-invasion. We went up to Craggyburn, sampled in areas where pines were invading and also in the native beach forest, collected roots from both pine and the beach, and also sporocarps, mushrooms, and then used DNA techniques to match them up. That's the data. You can't read it. Don't worry about that. All I want you to see is that there's a lot of blue there, which represents native fungi on our native beech trees. There are a lot of them. And there's a little bit of red at the top, which are the, is the fungal community on pines. So let's blow that up so you can see it. What you see when you look, to, look at it is that the most abundant fungi on pines were found only on pines, not on the native trees. And if I looked at where they came from, I've coded them red to mean that they were exotic. So they're mostly co-invading. There were a few fungi that we found both on pines and on the native beach. And I haven't coded those blue for native because they were native, but they didn't fit our hypothesis. We had missed the possibility. We thought that if you were native, it would be novel on pine, but actually there was a third possibility, which is that you would have a fungus that was native to New Zealand, but also native to Europe. We might call that a cosmopolitan association. And in fact, if I take that and rescale it, that's what it looks like in terms of the number of associations we found. No evidence of native fungi forming novel associations on pine, a small number of cosmopolitan associations, but mostly co-invasion. So that we have to understand this invasion is not just being pines invading, but also a fungal invasion. So okay, that's fine, that's one species. Is it generalizable? One question you can ask, is it generalizable internationally? And here, I haven't done the work myself, but other people in Hawaii, in South America, have done similar studies. And what they found is not only the same process of co-invasion, but actually the same species of fungi are driving pine invasion all around the world. We can also ask whether it's generalizable to other tree species. So there actually are a total of 117 naturalized ectomycorrhizal trees in New Zealand. Are they all co-invading? So we went out and we sampled. We started off, look, this was work by Laura Boger, I should say. Um, we started off looking at native, or sorry, invasive alder and willow, both of which are ectomycorrhizal, both of which are invading into river valleys. 
We chose those because they represent two opposite ends of the spectrum. Alder is supposed to be very, very specific in its fungal associations. Willow is supposed to be very, very general in its associations. And we were also interested in them because they co-occur at whether willow, which is there already, might actually facilitate alder coming in after it. So there's the possibility that fungi on one plant can cross over and infect another plant. And so given that these two co-occur, as in this photo, we thought there might be an interesting interaction. We went out, we collected roots, ended up with 405 root tips. We did DNA sequencing. There were very clean samples. We did direct DNA sequencing, worked beautifully. And to make a long story short, 100%, every single fungus we found was non-native. There were some interesting patterns. This is looking at two sites, the North Island on the top, the South Island on the bottom, the alders in blue and the willows in sort of yellow and red. If you looked at the distribution of the community, the alders had very few fungal species and they were exactly identical between the two islands. Willow though, completely different community on the two islands. What about the potential for sharing? There certainly was, but only on one island. So on the South Island, we see fungal species being shared between the two, not so much on the North Island. I wanna go on to one other plant species in detail, which is Douglas fir. Douglas fir is potentially the worst invasive tree in New Zealand in that it's the only invasive tree that's invading into for native forest, not just into grasslands. This was work led by Holly Muller at Stanford. And just to show, just like in the case of pine, Douglas fir was limited by lack of mycorrhizae. So here's a paper from 58 talking about chlorosis, yellowing of the leaves due to a lack of mycorrhizae. But now it's invading quite well into grasslands underneath itself so it can regenerate in shade and also out into the native forest. So Holly went out and sampled each of those three environments. This is the fungal community she found. And again, I'm coding the exotic fungi in red the native endemic species in blue and the cosmopolitans in green. And what it shows pretty clearly is that in the grassland, it's mostly exotic. Natives a little bit more in the plantation, but fair number of native species supporting Douglas fir invading into our native forest. So it suggests that it's still mostly co-invasion, but if you looked at it overall, about 20% of the associations in the native forest are with uh, native fungi. Holly also looked at this in the greenhouse to look at whether it mattered, how it functionally affected the seedlings. She had a very simple thing. She just looked at the color of the seedlings. Douglas fir, when it's lacking nutrients, goes yellow. So she measured how green things were. And what she found was that although everything had mycorrhizae, those in the grassland grown in this, a common soil still ended up being yellow, not as green. She also looked at the fungal community, and this is just an ordination, but what you can see here are that the squares are separate from the circles, are separate from the triangles. Hopefully, there we go. So each community was different, again, in the glass house. That's cool, but what's really cool is what she did next. We had grown each pot with two seedlings in it. As she harvested them, she was incredibly careful to keep them alive. So she worked at the microscope, dealing with them as quickly as she could, wrapped them up in wet paper towels so that she never had to kill them, even though she was measuring the roots. And then she could pair them up and actually compete one fungal community against another. When she did that, remember they started each with a distinct community. When you put them together, they all converged. If you put them with a, 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 a seedling that had been in plantation soil, all of the communities converged towards that plantation soil. Otherwise, it sort of went off in an odd direction. It's kind of hard to understand from the graph, but let me show you it as a picture story that three habitats. What her data shows is that out in the grassland, we've got mostly co-invasion, mostly exotic fungi, fairly low diversity, but they're also not very functional for the seedling. The seedlings are yellowed. Mostly co-invasion going on the plantation, but in the native forest, we do see more novel associations and they're functional. Those seedlings are dark green. They're doing well with the native fungi, but those plantation fungi are actually dominant and able to invade out into both habitats. So it may suggest that in the grassland, you've got pioneer fungi, which are easily displaced, but in the, in the native forest, it may suggest that our native fungi are facilitating the invasion, but then lose out in competition. Okay, that's four tree species. Uh, that leaves 117 left to go. Um, let's, not, let's not do that. I wanted a way to cheat, to not have to look at all 117. I realized that 
mycologists like to go out and collect mushrooms. And sometimes they actually write down the species of tree that it was associated with. And that data was sitting there available. So I got that data, I downloaded it. There's a lot of data on fungal associations for all fungi and for ectomycorrhizal fungi on the bottom. This size represents the number of data points. The smallest one is 886 records. So a huge data set. Mostly on an exotic host plant on the left, we find exotic fungi. And that's true both for all fungi and ectomycorrhizal. On the native plants, we mostly are finding native fungi. We want to look at the structure of interactions. The way ecologists do this is a little confusing. It's called network analysis, and it makes pretty pictures like this. This is between pollinators and plants, and you're hoping for something pretty like that. When you take the fungal data, oh, sorry, off, off subject. I should say, I had, to, I had to take my data and lump it up by tree genus, because my colleagues don't tend to be good at identifying trees. So it's all by genus. When I took all that data and lumped it up, it looks like this. Well, that's not much use. And there's a nice quote out there. It says, the ecological literature abounds in illustrations of networks which are impossible to interpret. And I think I achieved impossible to interpret. <laughs> but there, was a, there is a pattern here. The order of those boxes at the top is, is designed by the computer to, to minimize the number of crossing lines. And without me telling it what the boxes were, it perfectly separated the native species from the exotic species. So there's a hint of something going on. One way you can approach that is looking at modularity. Modularity has been developed for all sorts of uses in, in computing. This is actually a cell phone network. This is from Belgium. Some people in Belgium speak French. Some people speak Dutch. And they form two communities in terms of who calls who. You don't call someone you can't talk to, right? So I want to see if we could do this with fungi and consider fungi to actually be like a cell phone call. So you might consider it's a link between two plant species. And you can erase the fungus, so just consider it as a linkage. You have to put in some host-specific fungi as well, which form little loops back to themselves. That's like calling yourself on the cell phone. And when you do that, you again get a, a beautiful diagram. But again, a pattern comes out very, very strongly. All of the exotic species ended up being placed in one single community. So from the data, it suggests that all these exotic species are actually linked to each other through sharing fungi. That's completely different from the native species. I should say one exception was eucalyptus, which actually fell in with our native myrtaceae. But our native beaches, each genus comes separately. So our native species tend to have highly specific fungi. Our exotic species tend to have, be linked into these huge communities. Is that just a New Zealand thing? We went to the UK, where they also have a lot of introduced tree species, and looked at their fungal data, because there are an awful lot of mycologists in the UK. And when we do that, put it up uh, side by side, again, the exotic species, the introduced ones, are in squares. And again, almost every introduced species in the UK falls into a broad network, all interconnected, no evidence of communities. The native species mostly fall into their own individual communities, separated out. The only exception being Picea, which falls in with Pinus sylvestris, Scotch pine. So what this suggests to me is that introduced trees and fungi are restructuring the whole way that plants are interacting. They're forming this new super module of plant-fungal interactions that's being driven by co-invasion of fungi along with uh, and co-introduction. We're also seeing novel things happen in the new range. So we've got Australian plants associating with European fungi and European fungi associating with Australian plants in New Zealand. And finally, some of that's being driven because they're being put into soils that are not what they would normally be adapted to and that can, that can restructure the way the communities form. What about functional consequences? Remember this slide that I showed you of different shapes. We can actually classify all of those fungi in terms of their function. And when we, <coughs> excuse me, when we do that, um, they've come up with names from very complicated names like contact, short, medium. When you do it, it comes up looking like this. I know you're never supposed to show pie charts, but I think these are pretty cool pie charts. All the native species are on top. And if you look at them, what you see is all the native species have a fairly uniform distribution of types. They all have six types. All the exotic species are on the bottom. They've got fewer types. And they tend to be dominated by one or you know, they're not as evenly distributed. That shows up as a highly significant difference in functional diversity, that our native species have a more diverse community of fungi. But it also shows up in terms of similarity. Look at that top row. You cannot tell those four apart. And so when you do an ordination on that, what you find is those cluster very closely together. Our native communities have converged to the same solution for New Zealand soil. Our exotic plants have fungal communities that are all over the show. 
So what does this suggest? What I, what I think the data so far suggests is we've got co-invasion driving in, of grassland invasion by trees across species and across continents. We're not seeing modularity. We're seeing it all in one community so that one may facilitate another. And the fact that we're seeing the, the functional diversity being low and the species diversity being low on exotic species suggests to me that there's a risk that if more fungi spread, species that are not, trees that are not currently invasive could become invasive. So that's my attempt to segue into looking at how the fungi are actually spreading. I'll be talking about pine from here on, but we're very interested in how these fungi are actually getting into the environment. So this is work led by Jamie Wood at Landcare Research. He went out and did some night vision cameras. It's a little hard to see, but there's a mushroom right there. And the suspect enters the scene. And there he goes. Quite deliberately seeking out the, the mushroom. And again, suspect number two, again, very deliberately eating the, and eating the spore part of the surface, right? So we, then Jamie went out and collected actual feces. We had wonderful discussions about, is that one fresh? Because <laughs> we want a really freshly deposited scientific material. Um, he took that ground up, looked at the spores in it, to identify the fungal species, and what he found was a wide diversity of fungi. These mammal, sorry, these introduced mammals were eating both native and exotic fungi. He then took them, ground them up, put them in water, and poured them on seedlings of both native beech, Douglas fir, and pine. So that's what that looked like in the greenhouse. And then he measured the percentage of the seedlings that got mycorrhizae. If you looked at deer, what you found was none of the native beech trees were able to get mycorrhizae from deer feces, about 20% of pines and a little bit less of Douglas fir. So not huge numbers, but certainly more than the native trees. But when he looked at the Australian possum, it was overwhelming. Again, not a single beech seedling became mycorrhizal, but the pine and Douglas fir were getting lots of mycorrhizae from the possum feces. When we actually looked at the species of fungi involved, remember they were eating a wide range of fungi, only the non-native fungi were, were being dispersed. So that our native fungi are not adapted to being dispersed by the mammalian gut. So we have to understand it's not just as an invasion of plants and fungi now, but as an invasion of plants, fungi, and animals. And what makes it particularly interesting to me is you've got a North American tree associating with primarily European fungi being dispersed by an Australian mammal, forming an ecosystem in New Zealand that's never existed anywhere on Earth before. So what are the consequences of that? How is that changing our ecosystem? For this part of this talk, I just want to go back to this, to this invasion that I discussed. This is the Pinus nigra invasion at Mount Barker. The nice thing is that when it spread across the landscape, because of the way the seeds were distributed, it became quite sparse on one side, and we were able to get gradients of density. All the same age, but different levels of invasion. So we had plots with very few pines, moderate numbers, and very, very dense pines all within pretty much a homogeneous area. What I'll do for the graphs is I'll just put the biomass of trees along the bottom. So this is from no pines to lots of pines. And then whatever I'm looking at is percentage change. This is soil carbon. We saw a huge effect on soil carbon. About 20% of the soil carbon was lost as soon as the system was, was invaded, which Leo Condren seen before, but first time I think it's been seen in invasion. It doesn't matter because you get much, much more carbon above ground. You've got all those tree trunks, they're full of carbon. But it's still interesting. It suggests something's going on in the soil. Everyone's concerned about losing diversity. Oh, sorry, wrong slide. Um, we looked at nutrients. We saw small changes in the carbon and nitrogen ratios and a loss of total phosphorus a little bit. But the really interesting thing was when we fractionated that phosphorus. You can take phosphorus and put it through a series of extractions from very, very light extractions that get things that are very available to plants through 14 steps till you're left with some black gunk on the bottom of a test tube. They'll be very unavailable. And when we looked at the change in those pools, what we found was there was a decline in some pools of phosphorus, but those were what we would consider very available pools. Sorry, very recalcitrant pools. And we actually saw those nutrients moving from what was supposed to be unavailable into highly available pools. So that the pines were, were mining the system of what we thought plants couldn't use and making it much, more, much, much more available. Now we'll do diversity. People always expect a big loss of diversity. We actually found plant diversity went up at first and only went down at the very highest levels of invasion. But if you're concerned about diversity, man, the mites and nematodes were wiped out. 
Unfortunately, nobody really cares. Um, I mean, let's be honest, nobody's going out there saying, let's save the nematodes. But again, it suggests something going on in the soil, in the biology of the soil. Now, one thing we know about soils is they tend to either be dominated by bacteria or fungi. And so we, we expected that the system would be moving towards fungal dominance, because that's what the textbook says. It says, when you get a forest, it's fungal dominated. So that's our hypothesis. We measured it by actually using a technique that measures the cell membranes of bacteria and the cell membranes of, of fungi. It's called PLFA, and the data looked like that. I'm not going to put a regression line through that. It doesn't look terribly significant, but I will say it's not going down. I'm confident that it's not going down. There's another way you can look at fungal to bacterial ratios, though. And that is, you can look at who's eating them. So you can look at nematodes and actually look at the mouth of the nematode and say, is that a bacterial feeding nematode or is it a fungal feeding nematode? This was worked by Gregor Yates. And when he, when he did that, what he found was a very strong pattern that it was actually moving away from fungal feeders and more towards bacterial feeders, the opposite of what we expected. So what I think's going on, why is the textbook wrong? I think because we've always looked at grasslands and forests, found more fungi in forests and assumed a straight line. What our data suggests is that these early forests, these, these first stages of invasion are actually driving it the other way, even though I do think eventually it will get to fungal dominance. OK, what does that mean? Why would we care? Does that matter in terms of control? Well, one thing about controlling weeds is it's relatively easy to kill a plant above ground. I've yet to meet anyone who can take out the effects of a plant on soil. Right? How are you going to do that? So we went up to Craggy Burn to look at the effect of different management strategies on below ground feedbacks. And there, sort of a natural experiment had, had been created by different management. We had one area, which I show on the top left, where the University of Canterbury botany class goes every year, and every year they pull out all the pine trees. So they've kept it uninvaded. We call it continuous control. We had an area where they had gone in and controlled the pines and then allowed them to reinvade, lost interest. So we call that intermediate control. An area where no one had ever done anything, so we had intact pine. And then an area where there had been intact pine, but they had recently chopped it all down. So we call that late removal. Okay. We took soil from each of those four areas. We brought it back to the greenhouse. We grew plants in it. We actually grew a range of plants. We were interested in how plant species would change in their response to these soils. So we had three species that were ectomycorrhizal, pine, Douglas fir, and a native, kanuka. We also had a non-mycorrhizal plant and arbuscular mycorrhizal plants, including some grasses, which will become important. We looked at the growth of those relative to the area they kept pine out of, and we expected to see that the ectomycorrhizal trees would be helped out, that, they would, that pines would grow better where pine had been. We saw no effect of that whatsoever, which was somewhat disappointing. We thought, OK, that's growth. Maybe nitrogen. That'll be our savior. Nitrogen will show a pattern. It went down, not up. So that was confusing. But something jumped out at us, which was that the grasses, the sedge and the grass took off. They were growing incredibly better in areas where pine had invaded and then been removed. So again, suggesting some sort of change in the soil uh, of these systems. We looked at nitrogen. Here are the four treatments from very little pine, continuous removal, up to invaded and then removed. No change in the amount of nitrogen. But if you looked at the availability of nitrogen, if you looked at nitrate in particular, it went up astronomically in areas where pines have been chopped down. We also looked at phosphorus. Small changes in the amount of total phosphorus in the system. But again, you can look at available phosphorus. And what we found is a strong increase in the availability of phosphorus, the same pattern as we found in the other study. So big shifts in nutrients. We also looked at the ratio of fungi to bacteria, again using PLFA which is looking at the membranes of the cells. A small decline in fungal, fungal markers, really no change in bacteria, but that results in increasing bacterial dominance because you're losing out fungi, so you're increasing bacterial relative dominance. We also, again, looked at nematodes, looking at their mouth parts. The fungal data was just noise, noisy, did seem to go down, but the bacteria very clearly went up. The bacterial feeders were very clearly going up. So again, it's showing increased bacterial dominance. What about the plant community? What do we actually see in the field? When we went out and looked at those communities out there, 
We could classify all the plants there as whether they're native or not. And this is what the communities look like. There are a lot of words up there. There's no way you can read them. I hope you can't read them. But there's lots of them that are green. Those are all the native plants. The red ones are all the exotic plants. And then you can see the points. These are the actual plots. So what you had in the continuous control was a very native dominated system. As pines invade, they shifted the system towards pine dominance. That makes sense. There's pine right there. But when you removed those pines, instead of going backwards, you actually went in a whole new direction. And you went to a system that was dominated entirely by grasses. Unfortunately, not native grasses, but entirely exotic grasses. I have to say, this result I presented a couple years ago to a Department of Conservation staff member, and he just looked at me and said, yeah, we knew that. <laughs> but yep, um, there are lots of possible causes of this. Could be seed shadow, could be ability to grow quickly. But the fact that it's exactly what we find in the greenhouse when we've taken the soils out of that environment suggests that at least a portion of it is being driven by these below ground feedbacks. So let's put it together. Pines were initially very, very difficult to establish in New Zealand. We worked hard at it. We introduced fungi. We were able to get excellent growth of pines in plantations. That was good. We then introduced mammals that moved into those plantations. They ate fungi. The animals wandered out into grasslands and did what animals do, which was a way of dispersing spores. Those spores in the grassland allowed the invasion probably first of Pinus contorta with a fairly simple fungal community. But over time, that fungal community can develop. Remember from the network modularity that we see a lot of sharing, so other trees can then invade into the system by sharing fungi with the first established plants. Meanwhile, below ground, we're seeing big changes in functioning. Our native system is dominated by fungi with very strong pools of organic nutrients, organic nitrogen, carbon, or calcitrant P. The invasion of pines is changing that system. It's reducing the amount of organic nutrients, increasing the availability of nutrients. It's causing a loss of diversity of soil animals. But more importantly, we're seeing a shift in the dominance of fungi and bacteria with reductions in fungal dominance and increasing bacterial dominance. That doesn't so much get reflected in the bacterial biomass because nematodes come in and eat those bacteria. So the system has not is not a bigger engine. It's the same amount of nitrogen, it's the same amount of phosphorus, but it's turning over faster. It's just like you're spinning that, that engine faster and faster and faster. And the effect of that is making those nutrients available to plants, which we think is playing a major role in the invasion of these exotic grasses into the system. The consequence of which is that when you kill off the pines, you get first native grasses, and then you get more pines. I don't know, is that, is that the end of the story? Are we going to face a tourism industry driven by tourists coming here to photograph our pine trees? Um, at least there's awareness of this. I mean, there is, the government is making efforts. They did announce more funding for the control of wild and conifers. Mind you, we've already spent 150 million. I don't know if 16 million more is actually going to make a huge difference. Is this research going to make a difference? Is there any point to understanding the role of fungi in ecosystems? And I'll just show. I got this email last week. The role of mycorrhizae have in influencing how contorta becomes established is important to understand. Or from a management point of view, this knowledge is of limited use. <laughs> sort of uplifting message you like to get in your email box. Um, no, it's a good. It's actually really good to be challenged. Does this matter? How does this research inform management? So three points I'll make on how this research influences management if it works. Number one, the arrival of fungi can make a species that's not currently invasive more invasive, which suggests that we need to think about managing species before they become a problem. Okay, And I can think of no better example than eucalyptus, which is not currently particularly invasive in New Zealand, but is invasive in other countries. We should be thinking about managing it where it occurs in sensitive areas before it invades them. Just get it out of there. And I like this tree because it says danger, keep out, wrapped around. I don't think they meant as an invasive species, but nonetheless, it's good. And actually, I'll just point out, this is my student, Sam Tortolo, who's working on this. I think he has a poster outside. 
And this is one of his pots in the greenhouse, and we're already seeing Australian fungi sprouting out even when he planted it in the greenhouse. And there are a lot of species to worry about. Remember, 25,000 introduced plant species. If we have to spend $100 million on every one of those, it's going to get rather expensive. It's relatively cheap to deal with them early. Management lesson number two. This is the time to deal with invasion. Do you see the pine tree? Right there. Pine starts changing the ecosystem at very low biomass. If you can get in there now and manage it at the very earliest stages, you can avoid those changes taking place. And I don't think management is currently focused sufficiently on this sort of detection and management. Of course, some areas are too late, and you do have to go in and take out these pines. But I think my management lesson number three would be don't focus just on killing. It's fine to declare a war on weeds. You can go out, declare a war, kill the pines. You can develop your herbicides, codenamed Lucifer Brew, which is probably not a wise choice of names. But if you just focus on killing, it's pretty clear that what you're going to get back is just reinvasion of exotic grasses and reinvasion by pines. So you actually have to think not just about killing pines, but what you're trying to achieve and to focus on restoring the ecosystem, including managing those legacies below ground, those changed soil environments. I just want to end with one final quote. This goes back to the paper in 1930. One other thing Stephen said in that paper was, it would be a great advantage biologically and economically if species were not considered as isolated entities, but as units in a complex community. He recognized that in 1930 in terms of getting pine to grow as an introduced species. And if it was true for getting pines to establish, it's probably 10 times more true for dealing with pines when they become invasive. And with that, I will end, and I'll be happy to take questions. Oh, I guess uh, listening to you, I sort of started thinking, well, how can we get rid of uh, all these uh, terrible pines in New Zealand? And then, uh, yeah, I sort of thought, uh, them actually, uh, we need them because we have got an industry uh, growing pines. Mm. So this sort of indicates that, uh, well, uh, obviously uh, removing them can't be the solution. So uh, we just uh, created a new industry uh, forever um, trying to stop the evasion of pines into land where they don't belong. Uh, just yep. wondering, did anybody try to make a business case how much money we get from growing these pines and how much money we really would need to put into? Yeah. Pines are very, very preventing important. Them? Yeah, pines are very, very important as, as in plantations. Pine, that's primarily Pinus radiata, but Douglas fir is also a forget the, it's on the chart of the 14 most economically important species, right? So I totally agree, take your point. Pinus contorta is not valuable. It's just a weed. Pinus nigra is pretty much just a weed. And the wood's not high enough quality to use. I think Douglas fir is an interesting case because we have this tension between the forestry industry wants to plant Douglas fir. And they started planting it because it was less invasive and it's become invasive. Um, how we're going to manage that tension isn't clear. It's not a case of us versus them, though. The forestry industry does not want wild and conifers around their plantations. They're a reservoir for disease, and they have bad effects on how people perceive forestry. And they're also facing the liability of that invasion. So if we can find management solutions, I think the forestry industry will be straight behind them as well. OK? Maybe. <laughs> brought um, pines into the flatlands, and we weren't interested in them on the hill country. It was certain people who were interested in them on the hill country. Yep, fair point. It's also interesting to note how many of the worst invasions were scientific plantings. And as a scientist, we have to sort of take that on, the, on ourselves. I wasn't going to name names, but uh, <laughs> but yeah, working at Landcare, um, 
it was interesting. You work on invasive pines, and if you were past a certain age, you had probably started your career planting pines. Um, even my first job out of university, I was planting pines. We can learn, right? We can improve. Um, Ian, just on that last point about the accident or the scientific um, uh, introduction of pines, I mean, you're familiar with Craigie Burn. The very good reason why they were looking at different species up there in the high country was the perception at the time that to try and control erosion. We now know that it was, it was false, but yeah. the genie was out of the bottle. My question comes back to the thing that you found about nutrients turning over faster and under the under the... The pine, is that right? Yeah. Okay. Because we, we found that up in Craigieburn when we compared pine to grassland. In other words, pine that had been planted or invaded into grassland. And we found that the phosphorus was actually, t even though there was 30% less microbial phosphorus and carbon, the phosphorus was turning over almost twice as fast. Yeah. Can you just, just clarify for me why, why, from your interpretation and your system, why would it be going faster if it's got less carbon? Why would phosphorus be turning over faster? Well, in part, you're moving the biomass from fungi into bacteria. Yeah, okay. So, you know, fungal biomass is quite resistant to decay, quite long-lived. Bacteria is basically popcorn for nematodes. So the nematodes are eating the bacteria, secreting the, the phosphorus. Um, I don't know how much of that it is, but I think that's probably a big component. The control also helps release. I think a lot of that phosphorus isn't being directly released, but it's being taken up by the pines into the litter. And then when you control the pines, you've got this huge pulse of litter, and that's a big pool of, of nutrients being made available. One just next to you there. Behind you. Yeah, yeah um, to what degree would controlling the deer and possums have on reducing the spread? And would this be more economical than the methods they're using to control the pines at the moment? That's a fair question. The fungus that worries us the most is rhizopogon, which is this little truffle-like fungus. And it's, the deer really like it, the possum really like it. The problem with rhizopogon is it's probably got the highest spore longevity of any fungus that we know of. Um, there's a guy doing an experiment on it. He set the experiment up to run for 100 years. And so far, its viability is going up with time, not down. So. I bring that up because if, if you're in an area that's already got mycorrhizal fungi established, they've, they've already been dispersed into the area, they're probably there, right? So controlling deer in that sort of area will do you no good whatsoever. If we were talking about, there are some areas in Otago where they're doing new plantings of Douglas fir. If you could fence, if you could keep the deer and possum from moving, that'd be great. I don't think it's very practical. Um, maybe there's room working with some of the TB control efforts that are interested in reducing deer and possum populations, this could be an added bonus in some areas. But. I just had this one whispering in my ear, and so now I'm quite confused. But um, so you've, I'm going to put you back into the trees have all been wiped down and the soil's changed. Has there been any studies into, I guess, what could be planted into the soil or just to maybe change the soil back and then just help nurture the growth of natives and the fungi in there? Yeah, there hasn't been research done there yet. I think that's the next big step is to look for improved methods of removing pines. And my guess, if I was going to just put a, a guess on it, it would be to underplant with natives first. Yeah. And then rather than spraying from a helicopter, it's more expensive, but go in and drill and actually inject the herbicide into the pines. So you could establish the natives, slowly kill off the pines. It's, I can't imagine the expense that that would take, because that's a lot more work, but you might actually achieve something with it. Yeah. So. Really, uh, the genie's out of the, out of the bag, isn't it? I mean, these pine trees have taken off, and that um, anonymous doc comment is, it's pretty realistic. So, I mean, that's fairly pessimistic. And, and so what, what should we really do in the next 10 years? Say you were given a billion dollars, what, what can we do? Surely all you can do is, is just focus on, on some um, 
special native vegetation sites because really yeah. it's you can have any any number of university um, volunteers going up there with axes or something, but we're going nowhere. It, we've lost it. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple answers there. I would take a, some of that money and I would get rid of the things that aren't invasive yet. There are a lot of species. You look at um, Hawthorne. Hawthorne could have been managed 10 years ago with a reasonable budget. If we put a little bit of money there, we could have kept it from spreading. There was a few, pop it's, 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 that's gone now. There's no way. Um, so if we can serve, it doesn't make great headlines to say, I'm going to have a war on Hawthorne. Everyone's have a war on wild and conifers. Um, but instead of putting all our effort after the ones that are, are out of the bottle, thinking about those ones that are still in the bottle that we can stop now would be a very wise investment of resources. Um, and I agree, you, you, there will have to be an increased focus on particular areas, like above treeline. Pines go about 200 meters in elevation above native treeline. That's a critical habitat to keep them out of. So we should put a lot of effort into that habitat. In terms of the, the lower down grasslands, probably the only solution is to get them back to native forest. That's what they were before they were burnt for grazing. We're not grazing them enough now to keep pines out. So we should think about restoring them back into a native situation if that's what we want to if that's what we want long term. Um, the other interesting thing there is if you think about who pays the cost, there's a really nice paper came out of, um, recently by Gary Lovett. When you have a new incursion, the government pays the cost. Once it's widespread, it goes to individual landowners. And I think we're going to see that the pine's going to become less a government issue and more an issue for every high country station in New Zealand. The extra phosphorus would grow great uh, pastoral legumes. I've, I've wondered about that. You, you look at all these dairy conversions, pine plantations going into um, pasture, and you wonder if, if you can actually use that modification of soil yeah, nutrients. Yeah, yeah. You've got to be blind not to see it. Thanks, Ian. Uh, you talked uh, about the, well, I guess your examples really relate to the 117 ectomycorrhizal species that are problematic, but there are all the other 2,000 plus that aren't ectomycorrhizal. Yeah. If you were to give a talk about those, what would that story tell us? Would it tell us quite a complex story that might suggest much more sharing of fungi, less role of mammals, harder to control? Or would you see the many parallels in what you've seen with the ectos and with the um, arbuscular mycorrhizal? Yeah, well, okay, so let me talk about three different groups. Ectos, you're right. This is somewhat specific to ectos. And even within the ectos, although we see co-invasion for pines, alders, willows, probably eucalyptus, there are different species of fungi co-invading with each of them. So even, even there, there's some subtlety. Then you've got the, the ericoid mycorrhizae, things like heather. That's a separate story. They've, uh, they work with a different group of fungi that we believe actually co-invasion is probably occurring there as well, but in very different ways. And finally, you've got everything else, which is pretty much all our buscular mycorrhizal. So sorry if this gets a little technical, but this is a different group of fungi. They don't produce mushrooms. They produce small spores in the soil. Current dogma is that those are very widely shared and that you wouldn't see co-invasion. I'm not sure that dogma is correct. I think it needs to be tested. And that's where some of my new research on broom will actually go in that direction of looking at those fungal communities under other not ectomycorrhizal plant species. So watch this space in five years. Hello, I'm Colleen Phillip from Forest and Bird, and this is really timely for us because we've just been asked by ECAN to um, go into their new scheme for controlling wildings in the Craigieburn. So this is really, really important information. And I, I've already got some real good tips on, you know, <laughs> going forward, but and I'm, I'm not as depressed as some of the people here. I think there's <laughs> always hope. <laughs> and there is always people like you who um, do the science that leads us down pathways that, that take us into more effective ways of operating. But I don't want to go out just with volunteers bush bashing mindlessly. And so I'm thinking, are you able to help us, guide us? Because we're being asked to take on... Um, an area for ourselves. There's other NGOs who are involved in this space, like the tramping clubs, asked to take on areas ourselves and maintain 
you know, keep the wildings out of areas and, and take responsibility for zones. So I think with, with this information you're giving, that could actually be a constructive way forward because, mm. you know, with guidance, we might, small is sometimes very good, maybe we don't look to do too much, but do what we do very well. What would your thoughts on that new process that ECAN's progressing? Yeah, so I'm not mm. familiar with the details of it. Um, I would say, yeah, we've had pretty good uptake of this with Doc. They're definitely, despite the email, they are definitely listening um, and taking it on board. The issue at Craggy, there's a twofold issue. There's dealing with it where it is, with soil, and then there's taking it out where it is to avoid it spreading elsewhere. And I think the Craggy Burn issue is often about it spreading elsewhere onto the adjacent stations. Um, yeah, sorry, that's not a great answer to your question, but that's, that's about as best I can do. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Keep no, contacts are great. Yeah. Yep. Okay, cool. Can we take one last question in the middle here? <coughs> Ian, is there a possible role for biocontrol in this system where we have a group of problem fungi and we find some other microbes that may antagonistic towards the problem fungi and offer a method of control. Okay, I thought you were going to ask biocontrol on the pine. You'd have a hard time because these are exactly the same fungi that are supporting the plantations. So the, the, there are lots of biocontrol agents against pine, but the forestry industry hasn't been prepared to allow them to be introduced. Um, the biocontrol people are sort of sitting there hoping that maybe when the wilding conifers get bad enough, they can bring something in. I think eventually they'll get here, whether we want them or not. We will have massive die-off of pine at some point. Um, directly biocontrolling fungi, sure, it would be a fascinating area to investigate. We've been um, trying, so some of the fungi invade on their own out beyond pines into native forest, and one of those is Ammonita muscaria, the red, the red fungus with white spots that I think I showed a few pictures of. Um, We've actually been trying to come up with management strategies for that in native forest. And one of the things we propose is looking at biological control. Um, but nobody's tested it yet. It's very hard to get funding to test it because nobody's ever done it. So why would we research how to do it? And nobody ever does it because we don't have the research. To, so it's such a new area, it's been slow to get traction. I'm looking at Phil, hoping he'll, he'll um, <laughs> there, there's certainly, there are extensive lists of what's been introduced. There are lists of what is invading into different conservancies, and that's invaluable data. Um, there are also, I don't know if you've gotten onto Nature Watch, there's a lot of citizen science opportunities to record species and where you've seen them, photograph them, and again, it's really valuable data. Um, so yeah, there are, there are sources of data out there, on where things are. There are also studies that have been done that have looked at the dates of introduction of different species. So, so it's not just that one whole sort of data Oh, there's, yeah, there's certainly books that have summarized the current knowledge on invasive species in New Zealand. It's just they always are out of date as soon as they're published. So, yeah. Okay, well, could you join with me and thank Phil? Phil. Oh, Phil. <laughs> 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 you should have spoken before. That's the second time today I've been called you. <laughs> <laughs>